<clears throat> well, let's get into Galatians. And um, we have been looking at it for a while now. We've covered the greeting and occasion and theme, their defection from the gospel. Is your screen up? It is. Then Paul dealt with his authority defended as the Judaizers had slandered him. Secondly, the true doctrine explained when uh, they were giving him a false doctrine. Then we uh, are into now the third main point, and that is Christian practice exhorted. So we've seen the exhortation to stand firm in freedom, the exhortation to walk by the Spirit according to the truth of the Word of God, and now we're looking at the exhortation to fulfill responsibilities to others. <clears throat> we have looked at, begun to look at the um, assist the spiritually weak, verses 1 through 5. And the first uh, thing, and we've talked about this, although we didn't finish, uh, humbly restore faulty brethren. To humbly restore means we don't, enter into that restoring relationship with a proud heart. In fact, he really expresses this, do it in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And we wanted to talk about that a bit, the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We defined meekness as one of the fruit of the spirit, as the disposition, not just an act, but a disposition, a, a way of life, a disposition that responds with gentleness. Uh, I always think of <clears throat> Joseph, Mary's uh, uh, espoused husband, at the time that he found out that she was with child. She actually began to show. He knew it wasn't his, so obviously the only thing he could as assume was that she was unfaithful, and immoral, and so according to their laws, he needed to divorce her because to be betrothed was to be married. Sort of the step one, the step two is when they would come together and become one flesh, and at that point, the marriage would be consummated, the marriage would be completed. Well, in that in between time, divorce was allowed, and that for the very reason that he was thinking that he needed to do that. But my point here is that when he decided that he needed to divorce her to cancel out the betrothal, uh, and that had to be public to a certain degree, um, in other words, it had to be known that it happened, yet it says that he decided to do it privately. He did not want to bring her up on charges in front of the other things. I think it was uh, Charles Spurgeon in his commentary on Matthew that pointed this out and he says let's just determine that if we have something harsh to do let's do it as kindly as possible. Well this is the attitude of a spirit of meekness. Um, there's this whole pecking order of things where you know chickens are known for this that if if there's a weakness in one, the others come and pick at it and peck at it and, and uh, you know, take it down. Uh, Christians ought not to be uh, like that. We ought to be concerned, uh, helpful, and the, the point here is to restore the person as much as is possible. So Paul speaks very personally to consider thyself individually. You think about this. Recognize that correcting and restoring a sinful brother may lead you into pride. Uh, normally, if you're, if you're trying to correct somebody for a sin they're doing, you're not tempted to do that sin. You're kind of, the whole mindset is oriented against it as you're, as you're dealing with them. But the big thing would be pride. I don't do such a thing, but I see you do. You know, the whole attitude of coming across uh, with an offensive attitude of pride, which does not lead them 
to repentance, but actually to rebellion often. So uh, you may be led into pride. So let us stand firmly in our position of a sinner saved by grace. That's who we are. We are not uh, the person who Christ was so impressed with our spotless life that he said, please be one of my, my brothers. You know, We had to get saved. We were sinners. We stay sinners. And uh, to pretend that we're not doesn't help anybody. certainly doesn't help us. So let us grieve over the fallen brother. This is our attitude, see. Um, we don't come with a stick. We, we come with an arm around the shoulder saying, let's help. Let us help him to overcome his trespass. Let us guide him to ask forgiveness as necessary because sometimes the sin is just between him and God. And so all he needs is to ask uh, forgiveness from God. But sometimes the sin offends others. And we need to say, if you're going to take care of this, you have to actually ask forgiveness of the people you've injured. So take him through the whole thing. And then lead him in counsel to become accountable to you. This isn't asking him to come before the whole church and report every week, but just personally. You who are spiritual, restore the one. And so then say, I would like for you to agree to become accountable to me. We'll just talk and meet and talk. And uh, you tell me honestly, because this whole thing's foolishness if you're not honest, um, how well have you done? And frankly, when people have fallen into a habit, it's never easy to get over it. Uh, so we come up with uh, not what again, you know, we, we come up with I know it's hard, but we have to get ourselves thinking the right way. So humbly restore faulty brethren. Then secondly, bravely relieve crushing burdens and do it in love. Not again with pride. I'll help you. Verse 2 says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. <clears throat> so, in this passage, this entire passage, he says two things. Bear ye one another's burdens, and then a little later, and every man shall bear his own burden. So we say, what? What's going on here? Well, this is not a contradiction. This is explained by the fact that there's two different words for burden. Verse 2 uses Strong's 9.22, Baros, and refers to a very heavy load. When we get to verse 5, this is where he says, bear your own burden. This is Strong's 5413, Fortion. It refers to an acceptable load, like a soldier's backpack. Uh, what they had to carry, I don't know if Roman soldiers had a backpack, but, but the pack that they had to carry, their, their assigned task. So I want you to think, a baros as a box car, and a, and a, think of a fortion as a backpack. So, God has given you an acceptable load to bear. It is not our duty to re to relieve a person of their normal duties of life. Oh, you shouldn't have to pay for your own bills. You shouldn't have to pay for your own education. You know, uh, these are things that are damaging to people, that teach them they can do things without consequences. Now, um, when it's something that's too heavy for a single person, God is saying, I give those boxcar burdens to people to alert fellow Christians. Um, the idea here of... Uh, uh, one another is, is kind of a talk within the church, especially within the realm of fellow believers. So he says, well, then that just means that we are to come along and help. We are to be there and offer 
our help in pushing that boxcar. It wasn't made for one person. And he says that you will be fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, I hope you don't find that a mystery. For Christ said, a new law I have given to you, that you love one another. See? And it's actually not new. I mean, it came in right from the, the Jewish uh, uh, theme verse. Love the Lord with all your heart and soul and your neighbor as yourself. Well, um, when you find an impossible burden on somebody else, it may not just be a physical burden. We're dealing with a physical burden of, of moving all these boxes and things to another place. But sometimes that boxcar burden is, is emotional. This can be the loss of a loved one, uh, loss of a child. Um, these things do not happen, uh, you know, you, you don't get over them easily. And this is where you step in to help. It may just be being there quietly, listening, uh, opening your heart and mind uh, to the person, uh, trying to hone your senses where you can discern if they are hurting. I've often said that we come to the place, a person said, yeah, he says, they're, they're the, the type of person that when you say, how are you doing, they really tell you, you know. <laughs> um, well, then you don't really care is what you're saying. I ask, but I don't really mean it. You and I ought to be looking at somebody I, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm easily offended, but uh, I remember a situation when a, a pastor I was at visiting with his church, and um, he came over, looked at me, and big smile, you know, and held out his hand. And as soon as I took that, he's looking over to see who else he's going to say, so good to see you, he says, not even looking at me. Go, so good to see you. I was going to say something, and then he says, and he just leaves, you know. So that was a worthless gesture. <laughs> um, he didn't want to talk to me. He wanted me to feel welcomed in a way that was unwelcoming. He didn't understand that whole thing. When I, when I want to say hello to you, I'm kind of looking at you to see how are you doing, you know, and I may not ask that. But then when the person goes, oh, I'm fine, that's, there's a little signal there. Did you catch that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, that draws me to say, well, how are things going? You know, can, we, can we sit and talk for a minute? Because most people don't want to take up your time with their problems. Um, so be that person. Um, fulfill the law of Christ, which is love one another. And this is the love that tries to help. This is the love that says, as God so loved me that he gave his son to die for me and to save me from my sin. So I would like to help you. I would like to be there for you to uh, bear that burden, part of it, help, help if I can. Sometimes it's a financial burden that you may not be able to take on your own. I mean, a whole boxcar burden of finances. But... Um, I've read of the people, I don't, I don't know how to do this, but I've read of people that start the GoFund thing, or what is it called, kick, kick fund or something. Um, and uh, you explain it to a lot of people, a lot of people say, well, I, I can spare a dollar or two. But, you know, it's that type of thing. Can you do, uh, what can you do to help when it's uh, uh, clearly beyond that individual person's uh, ability to handle it on his own? All right. The next verse, wisely respond to praise. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Here's the situation. The one who is given to serving in love often receives praise 
from them that serve. And this is fine. This is uh, proper. We ought to be saying thank you. We ought to have a heart of gratitude. You know, it's, it's funny to me, not funny, sad, <clears throat> that um, the world is so slow to catch on to these things that um, I was seeing on the news today that a fellow who was fighting mental illness problems made bad decisions and, and got uh, sentenced for armed robbery. Well, now, as, uh, as a prisoner, he, he came up with this nonprofit organization, which he calls Ways, W-A-Y-S. Why aren't you smiling? And the, the whole thing, the whole, um, the whole uh, light bulb thing for him was that uh, consider what you have to be grateful for. And so they were saying, well, they, you know, there's counseling and there's yoga. And I thought, how about simple Christian faith that sees all the blessings that comes from God. And when you're so pouting, you know, you're like the kid that didn't get enough candy for dessert, you know. Um, it's not like you're missing anything. Uh, so many times we're upset because we didn't get as much as somebody else. It's not like we were lacking anything that's necessary. What kind of people does that show us to be? See, just ungrateful. The whole idea of contentment is to say, what God has given me is sufficient for me. Um, when you're at a place in your life where you say, life has become such a disappointment to me, I just sit down and cry. Well, my question is, what did you expect? Did you have these expectations from God that you were going to be what, you know, healthy, wealthy, and wise? You were going to be leading the class in whatever, you know? Was that your expectation? Contentment says, God is providing me enough food to eat and a covering on my body, over my head, and if I had nothing else, I should be content. The Bible tells us that. With food and raiment, with food and covering, be content. So if that's all you had, you should say thank you, God, because there are a lot of places around the world where they don't have that. You know, kids living in cardboard boxes in the alley. Um, so let us learn this whole thing. Uh, let us be grateful to a God who has supplied our needs. Well, this is the thing. Uh, who are you? And when you are praised, learn the technique of deflection. To deflect. You know, you have your, your armor, your shield, and so the fiery bolt comes at you and you deflect it, you know. Well, in this case, it's, it's praise. And um, the praise comes to you and you could say, yes, thank you, I am great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, that's not, not a good thing. Learn to deflect it. Now, when I became um, a pastor, uh, 44 years ago, we found that um, people were thanking me for all kinds of things. And it occurred to me that I could get very big headed, you know, about all this. But I also recognized that being gra grateful is a good thing. So I didn't want to shut that down. So I learned this thing of deflecting. So if you say to me today, that was just a great message. I really appreciated that, see. Then I will probably say to you, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and what I, you see what I just did there. I didn't receive that as for me, but reflecting it back to the one that... Uh, to, to, from whom it came, because I'm, I'm giving the word of God. 
Um, pretty young ladies. Uh, yeah, she looked up. Uh, pretty young ladies uh, uh, ought to be careful when people are saying, you're pretty. Well, I don't know. Did you do that? Is that a mask you're wearing? Did you invent that thing, you know? Well, no. I, I thought the best answer I ever heard of, uh, well, well, thank you. You ought to thank my mother, my mom and dad, my heritage, see? Um, I didn't, I didn't make myself pretty. God did. So thank God and others. And if you are successful, think of those that helped you along the way besides God and deflect that. Be honest without taking too much upon yourself. For this is the concept that he has here, to think of yourself to be something when in actuality you're nothing. For you can do nothing outside of Christ. He gives you the ability to take a breath, the ability for your heart to beat. This is, this is granting your life. And this is an important thing to remember, that without him, he said, you can do nothing. And so we are actually dependent. When he, when he was bringing the uh, children of Israel into the promised land, he said, now, I want you to build these memorials. And your kids are going to say, what is that for, Dad? So well, that was to remind us that God did this and God did that. And God says, here's why I want you to do this. Because after you get into the routine of being in the promised land, the land that flows with milk and honey, things are going to be easy for you. It's not going to be like walking through the wilderness and building a tent, setting up a tent and living in it and striking it and walking and finding manna to eat that just appears with the dew. Um, you're going to have land and property and, uh, well, I guess that's the same thing, and um, things growing, animals to eat, money to spend. And he says, I just don't want you to think that you did it by your own power. He says, because I want you to think who gave you the ability to earn things. And let's always be that person. Um, I am where I am because God opened that door. I, I stepped through it. You know, you can acknowledge that. But this is the idea. So um, we are warned here not to let that go to our heads. We remember Paul's admission in Romans 7, 18, for I know that in me, and he says, not me filled with the Holy Spirit, but me in my flesh, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. If anything good has come out of my life, it's because God put it there, see. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I know not, I find not. So let us be the hand of God that helps treating others with love that he gave to us. The very fact that you recognize the need of others is because he has recognized your need. So be the one who defects praise to the one that actually deserves it. Then again in verse 4, focus on responsibilities for, sat for satisfaction. You want to be satisfied? Focus on your responsibilities. Here's what he says. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. This word prove is the word that refers to putting something to the test. So you are mining out there in California, and you have a sparkly thing, and so you bring it in and say, look, I've struck gold. And he says, I'm sorry, that's fool's gold. Sure. That's, uh, what is that, pyrite, you know. No, sorry. Sparkles, but it's not worth anything. Well, what, what, what have you done with that nugget? You have put it up for testing. And he says, do that with your own work. Uh, you can be happy that you accomplished something, but was it worth doing? I'm always thrilled to read of the, the great scholars of old who, when they were writing their conclusions and making their discoveries, 
would say we praise God for making things as they are, that we can discover these things and so on. The, um, they used to say that uh, the study of theology, the study of God, the study of the Bible, was the, uh, what, the, the king or queen of all learning. This was the highest thing. The, the great classical works of music were written to the glory of God. They might not have been the greatest of people, but what they were doing was dedicating their life to God, their work. And uh, this, is, this is the great, a great way of thinking about it. So we are sometimes confused if we feel pride in a job well done. Oh, I shouldn't be feeling pride. Well, God here vindicates this. This is the proper kind of pride. Now, it's not that boastful pride, but it is a pride of doing a good job. He seems here to be emphasizing that we're to try our best to bear our own burdens so that not to overburden others. Well, my backpack is a little irritating. Would you mind carrying it for a couple of days? You know. Well, no, you'd bear your own burden. So you are doing a good job, and it might be a tough job. You might have a backpack of bowling balls or something. You know, it just might be tough. <coughs> but you do the job, and at the end you say, I feel satisfied with that. That was a good job. Good job, well done. You say to yourself quietly. So be discerning. Do something that's worthwhile. Do something for the right motive. And then at the end, saying, that was satisfying. You go through Ecclesiastes, and the great uh, wise Solomon said, uh, said uh, you know, simple, the, the simple laborer who doesn't have to worry about all these higher thoughts, he goes out, he does his good big, big job, comes home weary and sweaty and gets a nice meal and pays for the bills, and he says, this, this is a good life. All right. Then he comes to verse 5 where it says, God allows achievable assignments for every man shall bear his own burden. Again, carry his own backpack. God always intends for us to grow by meeting our obligations and paying our own way. It is a false compassion that seeks to remove any burden, every burden, from a man's life. You're not helping him. I mean, you think about the child, uh, my uh, brother-in-law, Daryl Moore, we've told the story before. His mother got worried that he wasn't walking. He was a little boy and wasn't walking way past the time. So uh, the family brought him into the doctor and the doctor checked him and he says, no problem here, but I've noticed something that all of your older girls are carrying him everywhere. He says, the reason he doesn't walk is he doesn't have to. Yeah, he hasn't had to bear the burden of his own weight on his own legs. I said, ah, that's it. <laughs> We've been taking too much of a burden off of him. So you don't grow, you know, until the muscles are, are tested. It's called um, hypertrophy. Atrophy is when muscles waste away. Hypertrophy, hypertrophy is when I used to work out with weights, you know. I press those things and lift them up and so on until finally the muscles were just exhausted and uh, and at that point you're ready to say okay uh, I, I broke them down by working and then they grew back stronger because God built your body like that that's why you get calluses where you're going to be working hard for a while uh, you get a blister first of all but then the, the body teaches itself to harden the skin and uh, prepares you for this. The uh, story of the uh, sideshow guys who would take a needle and would sew a button onto their skin, you know, and, and button their shirt on it and so on. And it just gross, gory stuff that, ooh, 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 they had to watch, you know, so people pay money to see these people do these things. Well, the thing is that after 
a year of doing this where it hurt every single time. It didn't hurt anymore. The skin just developed. God worked our body to do that. So let us um, achieve our assignments, and um, uh, God allows that. God wants us to grow in that, in that way. All right, he moves on to another section here, number two, provide for your teachers. Well, this is one of those awkward things where I'm, I'm, the, I'm the Bible teacher, I'm the teacher of the, in, in the church, and I'm teaching you about what God says about paying me. It's an awkward situation. So let me not enhance it here, but just share with you. Provide for your teachers, verses 6 to 9. First of all, share good with your teacher of the word of God. Verse 6 says, let him that is taught in the word, you who are receiving the teaching, share, uh, excuse me, uh, communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. The word communicate means to share, and uh, all good things refers to all things useful and agreeable. Uh, good, here is the idea of uh, pleasant things. So um, we, we've had people share their, you know, banana bread and, and things like this. Just appreciate it. Uh, and what they're doing is to sharing their good things, and that because they appreciate being taught the word of God. So uh, taught and teacheth are the passive and active forms of the word to catechize. You might not be familiar with uh, catechism and catechize, but it's the old word to mean to teach step by step. Uh, the uh, catechism is not, we, we all, I think I grew up only hearing of that with Roman Catholics, uh, learning the catechism. But uh, we found there were Baptist catechisms. Spurgeon, I think, wrote one of the Baptist catechisms. And we were teaching our kids this because we teach the kids Bible stories, but we don't tell them what that means, you know. So we, uh, it was question and answer, question and answer. And they, I would ask the question, and the kids would, would answer. We would teach them the proper answer. And because it was, each answer was spurred on by the question we asked, they would learn to say it correctly. <clears throat> we would correct them until they got it word for word. And this helped them out. Uh, this was a thing that they didn't understand very much as we began with them as little children. But uh, on the other hand, uh, as they got old enough to understand, they already had that, that knowledge, that wording was already there. So to catechize is to say something over and over again. You'll notice that I often repeat things. Well, that's because we don't always remember everything we've been taught. We don't always, uh, uh, there's always uh, you know, newer children, visitors, and others who haven't heard before. So these things are repeated so that we can get it down. So this is particularly the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 3 to 14, he, he didn't only say this to the Galatians. He says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So you got the ox treading out the grain. Corn is the old word for all kinds of grain. And uh, he says, Don't muzzle them because from time to time you'll stop and he'll go down and he'll eat some of the grain that's fallen on the ground. Oh, don't stop that, he says. So then he asks the question, doth God care for oxen? Well, he does because he gave that rule about oxen. But is that the only purpose, he says, or saith it altogether for our sakes? He answers himself, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. People who are working in your field for you ought to plow with hope that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown, if we, the teachers, he says, have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things, your fleshly things, your paycheck? See? Philippians 4, verse 14 and 17, Notwithstanding, ye have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. This is a thank you letter for a gift. He was in prison, and Roman prisons didn't feed, care for people. 
So you had friends who came and visited you daily and gave you food and drink. And um, so he said, the Philippians sent me a thing, and you have done well that you gave it to me. But in verse 17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He says, I love to see that you have a giving spirit. I rejoice more about that than I do about the gift itself, even though for him it was necessary. <clears throat> then in 1 Timothy 5, 7 to 18, let the elders, this is the pastors, that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. This word honor here uh, takes on the characteristic of, of what they receive for their services. Double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Dr. and uh, Mrs. Kopp will take us out to eat from time to time and say, well, we're, we're paying for it because we don't want to muzzle the ox. So she reminded me I'm, I'm the ox here. So, um, you know, of course, happily. All right, then <clears throat> having said that, he tells them, bear the challenge of giving. <sighs> giving of your goods is always a challenge because there's some part of us that says, it's mine, 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 it's mine. So he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He pictures a, an amazing thing of the farmer getting ready to dip into his bag of seed and throw it out on the ground and say, wait, I don't know if I want to give this away. I could take this home, grind it up, and make bread out of it, see? But he says, no, no, no. He says, this is the way God has made it. But if you choose to give it out, then it can return to you. You, you can only reap what you've sown. You only get back what you give. So here the challenge of giving is met by understanding that, in fact, <clears throat> you need to give for you to grow, for your crops to come in. To serve in love demands a giving to others and not a saving for self. He says, God is not mocked here. Mock pictures treating God with disdain. Um, if, you, if you refuse to understand that God is pledged to take care of you, his children, you who have accepted Christ as Savior, you're his sons and daughters. Now, are you going to doubt that? You see, I, I'm going to have to, you know, the, the, the story about the, finding older people that hide food in their closets and forget about it and then it all goes rot and so on. Um, these are people who don't think somebody's going to feed them for whatever reason. Those who despise the sharing with their teachers are those who despise the value of the word of God. I had one man say to me, what you have given to me I, I could not possibly repay. He said, if I, by some strange quirk of fate, ever became a uh, wealthy person, you would never have to w worry about needs again. And I uh, thought that was overkill. But the point is that he, he had the right attitude. Uh, he said, I'm going to, to give because of what God has given Next, he says, bear the challenge of putting self before God's work. Bear that challenge. We uh, say, well, I would give, but I wanted to buy a new this, and I wanted to buy a new that. See? So bear the challenge. He says, for he that soweth to his flesh <coughs> what I want shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There is this thing of giving in faith. Uh, God is taking care of me. I see that he continues to take care of me. I'm going to do that faith promise thing where I say, my wife and I were challenged to do this at one point, to give $100 a month to a cause we felt was very important. Frankly, we didn't have that kind of money. But we made this deal with God. 
faith promise deal, and that was we're going to give it as long as we can, as long as we don't have to spend it for pay for gas and electricity and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and at the end of the year, which was our pledge, we'd given twelve hundred dollars, and we hadn't missed a payment. You know, God actually supplemented our income for us to give that. And um, so what were we doing? We were sowing to the Spirit, and of that, we were reaping His gift. When you hesitate to give, you may be showing a focus on how you look and what you have for show. This is a corrupting direction. Giving to God's work enhances your eternal life. Puts a sparkle to your, your life everlasting. Then again, verse 9, he says, Bear the challenge of fleshly service. He says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. He says, I know uh, doing this and extra for others can wear you down, because... The world all around us says, you deserve a break today. The world around us says, uh, get that hair color because you deserve it, you know. Um, this, is, this is good for you, and you ought to, you ought to take care of number one. Well, God says, no, I'm going to take care of you, number one. I'm going to take care of you. You help others. And you begin to see this interplay that... Um, that there are others who are giving to you. What a remarkable thing that is to find this balancing out in your life. So let us not be weary in well-doing. When you conceive of serving and giving as a duty, a thing I have to do, more than a loving response to God and man, you will wear out. I have to do this again? <laughs> as Paul keeps the analogy of sowing and reaping, he points to the work in the field. So the guy goes out there and he sows that seed and he goes out the next day and he says, I knew it. I don't get anything back. It, it, nothing came up. So, well, no. You have to be patient in your well-doing. <clears throat> you cannot just have a good beginning. You must follow through before a good harvest will come. And it comes in due season. See the reference to the crops. <clears throat> but you must have patience. You must have endurance. Don't faint in doing the work. All right, we'll stop there as we get to the uh, growth of doing good, the thing that we learn by doing it and by self-sacrifice. Uh, we learn how to handle those things. Comments or questions then on this passage? Things you've learned or something you'd like to share? All right, well, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed with prayer. Our Father, we thank you for teaching us step by step, helping us to avoid the, the offensive attitudes of pride that says, I've done this myself. I sit upon a throne and I've ordered my own life. For Father, we have received of thee, we've received life and light and love, and our lives are filled with thee. We ask that you might help us then to be the hand of God in the lives of others, to see their needs, to help them when they can, to say thank you for teaching me the word of God, all of these things that are motives that you have put your stamp of approval upon. So we ask thy blessing today in Jesus' name. Amen.